about 26 viewers, Miss Hines. All right, we are live. And I will wait for Erica to confirm that she is also getting the live stream. All right, we are officially live. Well, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the second annual Northern Virginia Joint Transportation Meeting. My name is Mary Hines. I serve as Northern Virginia's member of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. I wanna thank you very much for taking the time to join us this evening. We all wish we could be here in person like last year, but we're so glad that many of you have made the choice to join us virtually this time around. Tonight's meeting is hosted on WebEx and it's streaming live on DRPT's YouTube channel. This virtual meeting is being held in compliance with Virginia Code Section 33.2-214.3 for purposes of presenting to the public and receiving comments on transportation projects proposed and conducted by each entity in Planning District 8 that are hosting this evening's meeting. Over the next hour, you will hear a number of presentations from transportation entities, all designed to allow you to learn more about transportation plans and projects proposed or underway that affect our region and the collaboration that it takes to keep our region moving. In a moment, I'll introduce the expert panel who will be presenting information and receiving your testimony this evening. On November 19th, Governor Ralph Northam signed House Bill 5. Uh, 1005, which is Virginia's revised biennial budget, and it includes new language regarding meeting electronically. In light of the continuing state of emergency declared by Governor Northam, we are conducting this meeting in a remote setting, keeping safety top of mind and mitigating the impacts and spread of COVID-19. I'm now going to turn it over to Karen Finucane Clarkson, who will go over some housekeeping items and information on how you can provide public comment um, and when in the meeting those options will be available. Thank, over to you, Karen. Thank you, Mary. As you can see, there are several ways to provide public comment, whether providing feedback live tonight or post-event through January 4th, we're looking forward to hearing from you. If you're not testifying live tonight, but would like to provide public comment, you can do so in the following ways via an online comment form available at virginiadot.org slash Nova Transportation Meeting, by voicemail to 703-718-6368, or by mail to Ms. Maria Sinner, VDOT, 4975 Alliance Drive, Fairfax, Virginia, 22030. All comments are due by January 4th, 2021. Should participants watching on YouTube tonight provide comments in the channel's chat box, their feedback will be noted for the record, along with all other comments this evening. However, chat box comments will not be read aloud to the panelists, nor directly addressed during tonight's meeting. If you've already left a voicemail in our public comment inbox, we will record your feedback for the public record, but will not be playing back those messages tonight for our panel. Anyone interested in providing feedback before the panelists this evening will be provided a call-in information number after each agency presents on their transportation initiatives. After all agencies are done presenting, we will begin taking public comment. With that, I pass the baton back to this evening's moderator, Mary Hines. Thanks so much, Karen. We are so very pleased to be joined once again this year by our Commonwealth Secretary of Transportation, Shannon Valentine, who serves as the chair of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. To kick things off, Shannon and I, we are hoping that you'll say a few words this evening. Thank you, Mary. Can you hear me? It's so funny, we all ask, just in case. Um, it's really great to be with you. I've started every meeting um, this past week by saying, I know this isn't normal. Um, and I know this is not a normal joint meeting with our Northern Virginia partners, but I really thank you, Mary, a fellow CTB member for helping to orchestrate this, all the teams uh, across the board from MVTC, MVTA, VRE, and 
at CTB, all of us coming together. Um, it's hard to start off without acknowledging the unprecedented time in which we are living. Um, from the beginning of this pandemic, uh, we at the state level have been focused on the health and safety of our employees, our customers, our partners. There has been a sincere commitment across the entire secretariat from the Port of Virginia, barges, trucking, transit, aviation, rail, all working together to transport critical goods and to connect people to essential work, medicine, food, PPE, and opportunity. As health and safety continues to be our focus, we are also facing the financial implications of this pandemic. Back in August, the governor um, announced to the money committees that the Commonwealth in transportation was going to be down about $870 million through FY22. And for those of you participating or listening this evening, that is a significant amount of money. For those who understand and know SmartScale, which is our prioritization process, for two years, the entire state, we had in the most recent round of SmartScale, $850 million. So that kind of reduction is serious. And unlike many other states who have had to cancel contracts and delay projects and lay off workers, our focus has been on how do we maintain our infrastructure priorities, maintain our pipeline of projects, secure our workforce, and contribute to the Commonwealth's economic recovery. That has been um, our focus through this period. And working with the governor and our General Assembly, many, I think, I believe, are actually participating this evening. Um, in special session, a budget amendment was passed. And the budget amendment is very limited, but did give the CTB, the Commonwealth Transportation Board, the flexibility over the next two years, the biennium, to allocate and reallocate our funding structure in a manner so that those projects that received dollars in the early year of our six-year improvement plan, years one and two, but do not require those funds until years three, four, five, and six, we are able to put those dollars to work today. And through this cash management solution, we are able to, at this point, at least knowing what we know today, we are able to maintain the projects that are in our six year improvement plan. We are able to secure our workforce and we are able to help stabilize and grow our economy here in Virginia. Tonight, um, Kim Pryor, who is head of our infrastructure and investment division, is going to be presenting a six-year um, improvement plan program update to you. You'll be able to see how we've been able to implement um, that flexibility. You will also hear from Ronate Day, who is the assistant director of our office for um, intermodal planning and investment, um, letting you know the priorities that we're putting in place to make sure that we're creating a transportation system and an economic um, opportunity for all people, and from uh, Director Jennifer Mitchell, who's going to be giving you an overview of our FY21 um, program update on rail and transit. As always, I look forward to listening to all the participants this um, evening. I'll be looking forward to listening and reading the public comment, and um, to assure you, my door is always open, and uh, Look forward to managing this period um, and managing what 21 may look like for all of us. So with that, Mary, thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. We are so happy that you are here and we very much appreciate the time that you are taking to join us. Um, I do wanna take a moment now to introduce all of our viewers to the folks who make up the panel of experts who will be listening to testimony this evening and many of them will also be presenting. Again, my name's Mary Hines, and I will I represent the Commonwealth Transportation Board uh, here in Northern Virginia, and so I'll be playing that role. You just heard from our wonderful Secretary of, of Transportation, Shannon Valentine, who chairs the Commonwealth Transportation Board. 
With us also this evening, we have Jennifer Mitchell, who's the director of the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, Monica Backman, who is the executive director of the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, Kate Matice, who, who is the executive director of the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, and Rich Dalton, who is the CEO of the Virginia Railway Express. So we want to thank them all for joining us. And as Secretary Valentine mentioned, there are a couple other presenters who will uh, you, you will be meeting in a moment. We do have we have been joined by several elected officials um, this evening: Senator Jennifer, Jennifer Boisco, Delegate Kathleen Murphy, Delegate Danica Rome, Loudon Supervisor Caleb Kirshner, Falls Church Councilman Dave Snyder, Loudon Supervisor Kristen Umstadt and the town of Leesburg Mayor um, Kelly Burke, and, as well as Fairfax County Supervisor Kathy Smith. So we thank them all for joining us. Um, you'll hear from some of them later, I believe, when we give public testimony. So we'll now move into the presentation part of our agenda, and each of our representatives will have about five minutes to present their transportation initiatives and coordination efforts that, are, that they're doing to keep our region moving. Our presenters this evening will include Ronique Day, who's the Deputy Director from the Office of Intermodal Planning and Investment, Jennifer Mitchell, Director of the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, Kim Pryor, Infrastructure Investment Division Director um, for the Department of Transportation, Monica Backman, as you all know, from NVTA, Kate Matice from NVTC, and Rich Dalton with BRE. Um, so thank you all for agreeing to present, and we're looking forward to the information that you are, are going to share with us. And with that, we'll begin with Ronique Day, who is the Deputy Director of OIP. Ronique, you're up. Good evening, and thank you for that, Ms. Hines. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. As Ms. Hines said, my name is Ronique Day. I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Intermodal Planning and Investment. And tonight, I'll share some information with you about VTRANS, which is our multimodal transportation plan, and where we are today. Next slide, please. So VTRANS is the Commonwealth's multimodal transportation plan. At its core, it really is what the board believes transportation Virginia should look like, and a framework to which we are able to advance the board's vision. Um, it really is a tool that strengthens the connection between planning, project development and programming. VTRANS is centered on five overarching goals that focus on economic competitiveness, which considers congestion and reliability of the network, accessible places and connected places, which also includes disadvantaged communities. And, you know, I'm gonna pause a little bit right here. You know, for me, I grew up in the city of Fairfax off of a small street called West Drive in Fairfax and, um, one of the things that was really important to me is that the Q bus was running and could get me to the mall and to work. And so this is a, an example of how disadvantaged communities are, are very important in making sure that there is access to, to transit. And then safety obviously continues to be great importance as fatalities and speed related crashes continue to be in it. Proactive system management is focusing on improving like bridges and pavements as well as ensuring that transit vehicles are in good and fair condition. And then healthy and sustainable transportation communities, which I, I think now with COVID, many of us are looking for ways to get out of the house and bike as well as walk. And so this is looking at the opportunity to decrease trips by increasing travel by biking and walking. And as well, we'll look at passenger fleet vehicles and how many of them are hybrid and fully electric. So essentially VTRANS is, what are the problems that we are trying to solve for? Next slide, please. So in January of this year, the board adopted the midterm needs. And those midterm needs were built upon the last VTRANS update. Many of you may have heard of it as VTRANS 2040. And what we did is we refined the approach and needs more data driven. The purpose of the midterm needs is to identify the most critical transportation issues over the next 10 years. And there are four areas that the needs are developed for. Corridors of statewide significance, which serve long distance and regional travel, regional networks, which serve commuters and local travel, 
urban development areas or UDAs, which are locally designated areas that promote walkable, more dense communities. And then also there's a component to the UDAs, the industrial economic development areas, which was new this year, and working with VEDP as well as locally identified sites. These are sites that have potential for development and then safety. The key takeaway here is that the adopted midterm needs are really what feeds the smart scale program. In order for a project to be considered for smart scale, it must first meet a VTRANS need. Next slide, please. So I'll move a little bit into prioritization and right now what those efforts look like. So prioritization ultimately is looking at the degree to which a problem exists and helps us to identify which ones we, being the state, DRPT and VDOT, want to spend our limited planning dollars to study and then further develop solutions for. Prioritization is a multi-step process that establishes two sets of priorities. Statewide priority, which is based on the needs identified on the quarters of statewide significance. So here we're talking about Route 66, for example, on any five or I-64. And then district priorities, which is based on regional networks that facilitate connectivity and mode choice. We then look at criteria to prioritize those needs and those four items that you see here on the slide. First, you know, how severe is the need? How many are impacted? And, you know, for example, how delayed are you when you're traveling to work? Um, I remember when I was living in Woodbridge and I used to have to travel to Chantilly for work. And if I timed it just right, I would get out of work, right, get out of the house right on time to arrive at work with a bit of ease, re relatively speaking. But if I was off by just a few minutes, I would end up sitting in traffic. So this particular criteria looks at the severity and the number of people that are impacted. Next, are there improvements that are already in program in the six year improvement program that address a need? So this is something that we are looking into and, and are furthering work on. Obviously, if there are improvements that are already planned where construction will be coming, we want to look at it and see the degree to which that improvement impacts or creates a situation where that need gets better or improves. Next, we'll consider locations that have multiple transportation needs identified. So we may see where there's a location where there is a lot of congestion. There may also be a transit need that exists and possibly there could be a safety need all in the same area. And so we would like to look where there's multiple needs as well. And then from there, we take those needs weighted and aggregated. And then last, we'll also look at associated risk for recurrent flooding and sea level rise. Next slide, please. So over the past month, our team has held several virtual workshops, four to be exact, and have sought comments on the approach to prioritization. All of this information is available online. Um, certainly, we're continuing to take comments. And in January um, coming up, 2021 in the new year, we plan to present draft policy to the CTB for consideration. And then at that time, staff will make policy recommendations and also get feedback from the board on those next steps. And then after that, we will go back to the board in February to seek action. And, and so before we get to that point, I, I do want to take the time to stress the importance of providing comments back to us so that we can certainly walk those through with CTB and provide them with that valuable feedback. And then building on these steps, we will be working on the multimodal project pipeline. And that pipeline really is seeking to identify the most cost effective solutions to addressing those most challenging transportation issues. From that, um, there are state resources that we are using to help create a new pool of projects that can be considered for the next round of smart scale and other grant programs. Development of these projects are going to be overseen by an executive work group that's been put together, and that includes um, our Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Nick Donahue, executives at VDOT and DRPT. There will definitely be more to come on the project pipeline in coming months. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ronique. Um, let's go next to Jennifer Mitchell. Great. Uh, um, 
Thank you, uh, Mary, for the introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here today. We are um, giving you all an update on uh, the uh, DRPT six year plan uh, for FY21. And again, the changes that have been implemented um, or introduced over the last six months. Uh, next slide, please. So, as Secretary Valentine described in the session, special session, the General Assembly provided the CTB with more flexibility to um, to be able to adapt and and utilize its funds in order to meet our highest priorities. Back in the budget that was passed by the General Assembly in April, it, the budget included language that would also allow DRPT to be able to use funds from other programs to be able to support. Our highest pro, uh, priorities, including statewide operating assistance, which is very critical uh, to the uh, transit agencies across the state in Virginia. It, we also wanted to make sure that we would be able to maintain our commitments to WMATA uh, over the next fiscal year as well. And as well, a budget amendment that allowed us to maintain our agency's um, operating budget at pre COVID levels. Uh, next slide, please. So our priorities for FY21 reflect all of those um, uh, those trends. We are fo focusing on our transforming rail in Virgi Virginia initiative. We also are going to be focusing our resources this year on being able to support essential transit and rail services, including statewide operating assistance, WMATA, and still being able to fund critical transit capital needs at agencies across the state, particularly high priority state of good repair requirements. Overall, this year we'll be allocating 708 million uh, in transit and rail funding uh, across the state for this fiscal year. Uh, next slide. So our Transforming Rail in Virginia initiative is um, was announced originally back in December, almost a year ago um, of last year. The Commonwealth is going to be entering into a partnership with CSX and with Amtrak to build out infrastructure to acquire uh, right of way and then also to um, significantly increase passenger rail service um, on our uh, Fredericksburg line and also doubling state supported service uh, for Amtrak between DC and Richmond. This will be implemented by the new Virginia Passenger Rail Authority, which was um, created in the 2020 General Assembly session um, and will we'll be receiving about 25% of the funding from Amtrak. Uh, next slide. So this is a true paradigm shift for transportation, um, for passenger rail transportation in the Commonwealth. Today, uh, we operate all of our Amtrak service on privately owned tracks that are owned by either CSX or Norfolk Southern. We will be acquiring as part of this over um, 350 miles of right of way and 225 miles of track in order to uh, be able to support passenger rail service in the future. We will be constructing another 37 miles of infrastructure between um, Richmond and Washington, D.C., and we will also be constructing a new expansion of the Long Bridge, which is a $1.9 billion uh, expansion of a bridge uh, that's currently owned by CSX uh, between Virginia and D.C., which is currently one of the biggest rail bottlenecks on the entire East Coast. Uh, we are not able to expand any more passenger rail service for VRE until that bridge is expanded. It's at 98% of capacity today, so this is extremely high priority for the company. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this, there's three major elements of this. We'll be acquiring right of way and track. We will be building infrastructure upgrades, including the um, new Long Bridge expansion, and we will be getting additional service. The whole, entire uh, objective of this program is to be able to add new service, not just to purchase right of way or build infrastructure. We'll be doubling uh, state supported service between Richmond and Washington, D.C. We will also be expanding a new round trip to Norfolk and another round trip to Newport News. And this will also provide us with the capacity to be able to add a future round trip, a uh, second round trip to Roanoke as well. In addition to that, we'll be expanding uh, VRE service by 75% on the um, uh, Fredericksburg line, including adding some weekend service and adding late night uh, VRE service as well. Uh, next slide. On the transit side, our um, goal has really been to be able to provide a steady level of operating support to our transit agencies across the state. As we know, COVID has been um, very devastating for transit ridership. However, transit continues to be a major lifeline service 
and an essential work service, particularly for getting um, healthcare workers and other um, essential workers where they need to go. So um, in order to do that, we wanted to make sure that we could continue to maintain our statewide operating assistance, even um, in light of any revenue decreases, which uh, Secretary Valentine alluded to earlier. So with that, we were actually able to maintain and slightly increase the amount of um, funding we've provided to our um, transit agencies for operating assistance this year uh, to 101.6 million. We that also includes some federal CARES Act funding that we'll be distributing to uh, rural and um, uh, rural systems across the state um, as part of that federal uh, CARES Act package. That does not include federal CARES Act funding that urban agencies have received directly from the Federal Transit Administration. Um, in addition to that, of the operating funding, we're providing about 47.6 million of operating assistance to the Northern Virginia uh, transit agencies. That includes Arlington Regional Transit, the Fairfax Connector, Loudoun Service, um, Alexandria Dash as well. So most agencies are going to see an increase of their operating funding over levels in FY20 that may um, not be true for everybody. We may see some slight decreases because we use performance metrics to allocate funding every year. And so some uh, distributions may change based on those performance metrics. Um, but 33 out of the 41 agencies across the state are actually seeing an increase in their overall operating assistance uh, between FY20 and FY21. Uh, next slide, please. On the capital side, we wanted to make sure that we could continue to fund very critical state of good repair projects, and that includes critical uh, vehicle uh, replacements uh, for bus replacements across the state. There are also some very important um, facility upgrades needed as well that we'll be funding. Um, we will be, all of our allocations reflect both an assessment of readiness and of urgency for those projects, as well as um, whether or not they meet our um, merit uh, scoring criteria as well. For uh, OmniRide, for PRTC, we'll be providing four buses. In Lana County, we'll be providing funding for five buses. Fairfax Connector will receive funding for the rehabilitation of 37 buses. And for NPTC, we'll also be providing funding for the Route 7 BRT study. On the VRE re track lease payments, a shift that we have in our six year plan where we used to fund these out of our transit program, these are now going to be funded out of our rail program with the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority. Uh, next slide. Uh, for WMATA, it's very important that we also were able to maintain our commitments uh, both to the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission localities, but also our commitments to WMATA in our partnership with um, DC and Maryland for the region. So we'll be maintaining our 50 million uh, match for PREA funding. This is a match to 150 million that uh, WMATA receives every year from the federal government for capital funding. In addition to that, we'll be providing 173.6 million in support to WMATA um, for both operating and capital needs. These are funds that we provide directly to NVTC that are then used to help offset the subsidies of the local, local jurisdictions. And I should note that's actually a $14.6 million increase over the levels we provided in FY20. In addition, we'll be providing funding to maintain our commitment in dedicated capital funding. This is a commitment again that we have with DC and Maryland to provide $500 million a year to WMATA in capital funding for critical needs. Um, to the degree that any one partner has to reduce their contribution, it affects the contributions of other uh, the other two partners as well. So very important for us to be able to maintain that funding level to WMATA for next year. Uh, next slide, please. And that is it. And I look forward to hearing uh, your comments and questions later. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, next up is Kim Pryor um, from VDOT to talk to us about infrastructure investment. Good evening and thank you, Ms. Hines. Uh, tonight I'll be presenting to you information on the department's strategy for updating the FY 2021 to 2026 six year improvement program. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, as you all are most likely aware, 
uh, the General Assembly special session ended November 9th, and the governor signed the budget on November 18th. The budget provides uh, certain flexibilities related to the six-year program and mitigating the impacts of the revenue reductions resulting from the COVID pandemic. Specifically, the, the budget provides that the fiscal year 2020 to 2025 six-year improvement program adopted by the board in June of 2019 could essentially be carried forward and remain in effect through June 30th of 2021 or into, until a new six-year program is adopted based on a revenue forecast that reflects the impacts of the pandemic. It further provides that assistance for fiscal year 2021 may be maintained up to the levels in the 2020 to 2025 six-year program until a new program is adopted. And third, it also provides that the board may use previously allocated funds that aren't currently needed to support a project schedule to mitigate the impacts from the revenue reductions uh, and replace those allocations in the year needed to support the current project schedule. Next slide. The, the uh, flexibility language further provides that the CTB must take all actions necessary to ensure appropriate debt coverage ratios, as well as um, distribute funds to the modal programs and the HMOS in such a manner as to protect core program services and existing projects. And then finally, the secretary must report to the governor and chairs of the House Appropriation and Senate Finance and Appropriation Committees on the funding actions both planned to be taken under this authority, as well as uh, the list of projects and programs impacted and any deviation from the proposed plan. Next slide. Our approach to updating the fiscal year 2021 to 2026 six-year improvement program has three components to it. Um, next slide, please. The first component is really about building upon actions approved by the board to date to amend and modify the uh, FY 2020 to 2025 program. Uh, we have updated various federal and state funding programs through amendment and transfer actions approved by the board through November of 2020. We've continued to advance approved projects according to their existing schedule. Next slide. The second component is to execute a targeted approach focused on updating specific funding programs based on funding levels in the FY 2020 to 2025 six year program. Uh, in the six-year program presented to the board that will be presented to the board tomorrow, we are proposing adding newly selected local and VDOT bridges through our State of Good Repair program, as well as uh, awards from the current solicitation cycle for revenue sharing. Uh, there's a slight change to the revenue sharing awards in that those allocations will now be provided in the last two years of the six-year improvement program. And again, those will be presented to the board tomorrow morning um, for action with its adoption of the 2021 to 2026 six-year program. Uh, there's also an allocation strategy for revenue sharing projects wherein we will be utilizing previously allocated funds that are currently needed to support project delivery to mitigate those impacts from revenue reductions resulting from the pandemic and replace those same allocations uh, in fiscal years 2021 through 2024 as necessary to support the project schedule. It's important to note that no funding commitments will be reduced and no projects are being delayed from their current schedule due to this uh, allocation restructuring strategy. Uh, there's also a change moving forward to the revenue sharing program where the biennial solicitation will continue um, every other year, but the awards will be for funding in the last two years of the six-year improvement program. Next slide, please. The third component of this strategy 
is to defer certain processes and procedures of a typical uh, six year program update. Hopefully um, this program has been anything but typical and hopefully it will be one of a kind. Uh, but for this um, update, we are retaining the existing structure of the FY 2020 to 2025 six year program uh, and reflecting adjustments to the new transportation funding formula and distribution factors in the update that will begin in early 2021 for the FY 2022 six year program update. We will defer adjustments also to the Interstate 81 program to reflect adjustments to the revised tax structure recently passed by the legislature and debt financing. This is not anticipated to negatively impact project schedules. And then finally, we were unable to hold our typical fall and spring public meetings um, this year. Uh, we did hold a virtual public hearing in November, in November um, and hopefully we will return to our normal uh, fall and spring public meetings next calendar year. Next slide. This slide shows a table of the revenue sharing projects included in the allocation restructuring strategy. 290 projects across the Commonwealth have uh, had previously allocated revenue sharing funds um, released and then repaid in FY21 through 24 um, to the amounts shown in the table. The, this table reflects the plan that was presented to the board uh, back in October. There have been some adjustments to that in what will be presented to the board tomorrow for adoption based on project activity that has occurred over the last several months. Again, uh, no project schedules are being uh, negatively impacted and no funding commitments are being reduced. Next slide. So our, our next step include some of those reporting requirements that were included in the budget language. Um, within five days of our presentation to the board in November regarding the plan to execute this six year program update, we did uh, submit the required um, reporting to the General Assembly committees and governor. Um, after we uh, adopt, after the board adopts the program tomorrow, uh, we will be submitting another report to the governor and general assembly um, reporting any changes to those previously planned funding actions and again um, tomorrow we anticipate that the board will approve recommended state of good repair local and vdot bridge projects as well as um, recently selected awarded um, revenue sharing projects from the current solicitation cycle as well as adoption of the FY 2021 to 2026 six year improvement COVID-19 update. Uh, and then beginning early 2021, we will begin the development of the next six year improvement program. Looking forward to the next six year improvement program, uh, round four of smart scale will be a, a major component of that program update. Uh, round four is, is currently underway. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you to go to the next slide, please. There are uh, 31 applications that have been submitted for the Northern Virginia District. Uh, they, they span the spectrum of the types of projects eligible for smart scale funding. Um, there are four bike ped projects, 23 highway improvement projects, three bus transit and one rail transit. The total cost for the submitted applications is estimated to be around 2.6 billion. The total amount of the smart scale funding requested is about 1.6 billion. Um, we are currently um, scoring those projects and in January, a staff recommendation will be presented to the Commonwealth Transportation Board based on the rankings and the scores of those submitted projects. And then ultimately uh, adoption of the selected projects into the six year program uh, approved by the board in June of 2021. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. So much, Kim, really appreciate it. Um, we'll move on now to NVTC, I'm sorry, NVTA and Monica Backman. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So I'd like to note that this past July, 
the authority adopted its six or, or, or six year program update encompassing fiscal years 2020 to 2025. This six year program update was the authority's fifth funding program and it was our most competitive to date. The authority we were able to allocate $539 million in regional revenues on 21 transportation projects throughout the region. And I will also note that the modes that we cover are various. We're multimodal, roadway, intersection, interchanges, rail, bus rapid transit, bus facilities, and bike and pedestrian facilities as well. Additionally, there was $1.44 billion in regional revenue funds requested for 41 projects. So while we were in a position to fund $539 million, we received $1.44 billion in requests. And I have to note the impacts of COVID. The authority, like every other regional entity, like the local government, federal government, and what have you, we were impacted by COVID. COVID revenues reduction meant a loss of $245 million in regional revenue funds for the life of this six-year program. So even though we experienced that loss, we were still able to fund a program update valued at $539 million, but we were also able to honor every single funding commitment on the four previous funding programs. And that's critically important because of the policies, the tools that the authority has in place, we did not have to go in and make any program reduction, delay projects or things of that nature. Next slide. So a tool that the authority released earlier this year is called the Nova Gateway tool. This Nova Gateway is a dashboard that allows anyone to get real-time project status updates on projects that the authority is funding with regional revenues. The newly launched tool allows searches by project location, transportation mode, corridor segment, and project sponsor with just the click of a button. So if you're interested in a project that's located in Prince William or Fairfax or Loudoun County, you can go in, click on the project sponsor and the location. And even though this uh, tool is used for projects that the authority is funding, we also note that projects have other funds on them as well. As we are all too familiar here in this region, it takes more than one revenue source to really see projects come to fruition. So you can access this tool on novagateway.org or by going to the authority's website at thenovaauthority.org. Next slide. Because of COVID and what we were seeing in regards to the transportation network, the authority contracted with AIDCOM to get an idea and to assess the transportation impacts and opportunities that COVID-19 was having on the transportation network. We wanted to look at commuting patterns, changes of behavior, especially when we were at almost 100% lockdown with the exception of essential workers. Our goal was to explore impacts to operating conditions and future transportation project investment considerations. We looked at scenarios and impacts and, the, and, and we looked at analyzing plausible, possible future scenarios. Let me say that again, plausible, possible future scenarios, plausible. It doesn't mean that these is what is going to happen, but what could happen. And also I must note that these scenarios were not intended to predict the future, but just give us some point of reference on things we need to consider as we may continue to make funding investments. So we looked at scenarios developed based on policies, travel choices and behavior, potential impacts that we looked at use transportation models, and then the results will inform potential short-term policies and future transaction analysis. Transaction, which is the region's long-range transportation plan, and I'll speak to that a little later. Next slide. So with the analysis and scenario assumptions, we looked at a quick recovery, active transportation, second wave, which we are currently in, and then the cautious recovery. We looked at teleworking. And of course, initially when everyone was teleworking, we saw commuting travel drop and it was almost non-existent. But now just in a few short months, we are seeing, especially on the roadways, that we're, all, we're at about 90% pre-COVID levels. Bus transportation and bus travel has also 
measured up and, and we're back to nearly pre-COVID levels. Rail isn't doing as well, and we want to make sure that we continue to invest in rail, even though it's not doing as well at this particular point in time, it doesn't mean that it will continue to, to uh, lose ridership. Because one of the things that we know in our analysis is that school attendance has a direct impact for those who are continuing to telework. As schools continue to open up, as we see these vaccines coming on board, and as people be, can, uh, get vaccinated, we will probably see more people commuting to work. And then there's the issue of transit safety perception. Do people feel that transit is safe? Uh, one of the things that we know, and we got this information during various surveys, was that people feel a little more comfortable traveling alone in their car because there is a, a perception of safety compared to traveling in transit vehicles with others. But I will know, and I have to give my hats off to Rich Dalton, Paul Wiedefield, Bob Snyder and the other operators, they're doing an excellent job in messaging that transit is indeed safe. Next slide. So looking ahead, what does the COVID impact analysis mean for us? So there are some transportation silver linings. Of course, we saw reduced driving, less congestion, lower emissions, and we also noted a recovery of local bus service. However, the reduction in commuting traffic did allow some of the projects, the major mega projects in the region to get on schedule, to continue to, to come to fruition, because it's one thing that we do note is that this is a moment in time. It does not mean that we should stop making infrastructure investments due to what we're seeing now due to COVID. As I noted earlier, the vaccines coming online and schools open up, things of that nature. We have to make sure we're paying attention to this because the region's population and employment increases are projected to be 24% increase in population and 37% increase in employment. And we want to make sure that we have the adequate infrastructure investments necessary to handle the increased population and employment. In looking at the COVID impacts analysis, there were some areas of potential concern. Again, as I noted, the rate of transit recovery and the perception of transit safety. And again, the transit agencies are doing a wonderful job trying to get that message out that transit is indeed safe. I think I heard, uh, saw one of the messages from one of the uh, CDC experts saying that, you know, you're probably safer on transit than going to, into these stores. However, the messaging is very important. Some of the unknowns, we, I noted that the return for schools, kindergarten through 12th grade, when will they return? Because you have a lot of people that are continuing to telework and fortunately in a position to do so because the kids are still doing virtual learning. Additional uh, long-term long unknowns, work from home practices and preferences. You know, a lot of employers that we heard from are saying, hey, you know, we found that our employees could be equally productive or as, as productive as they were working from home compared to being in an office. What happens with e-commerce trends, click versus brick? What happens with commercial and residential real estate trends? These are the types of things that we need, that we need to follow. And again, because we have a projected increase in population and employment, it is important that we continue to invest in the transportation network and this infrastructure. Next slide, please. So the transaction update. As I noted, transaction, Northern Virginia's long range transportation plan. We up the, update this long range transportation plan every five years. The current transaction was adopted in October of 2017. Projects that the authority funds with the regional revenue, so that $539 million six-year program that we just updated in July, those projects, every single project must be in transaction to be eligible for those funds. This is what the Code of Virginia requires. As we update transaction, we will do a deeper dive into the assessment of the COVID impacts on transportation. Again, while it's important to continue to make infrastructure investments, and I must know infrastructure investments are multimodal. We know here in Northern Virginia that there is no single mode that really solves the transportation woes whether it's transit, whether it's bus rapid transit, rail, uh, roadway facilities, trails, or what have you, we want to make sure that we're making the proper investments to sustain the network. 
And then we had three goals for transaction, improve mobility, increase accessibility, build resiliency. Public engagement will happen throughout all phases of the transaction update. So what that means is we will not come to the public when we have a draft plan and ask you what you think. We want the citizens, we want the public to be a part, a critical part of the development of that plan. And at this time, we anticipate that the authority will adopt transaction in the fall of 2022. Next slide. Another initiative that I would like to speak to briefly is the Virginia Regional Multimodal Mobility Program. Try to say that quickly. Um, we call that RM3P for short. And RM3P is a collaborative program to improve safety, reliability, and mobility for travelers in Northern Virginia. And when I say it's a collaborative pro program, it's the authority, it's the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, it's VDOT, it's the member localities, it's the transit agencies. We all are working together to try to improve safety, reliability, and mobility for travelers. I will note that the funding from this program did come from uh, the intermodal Excuse me, I want to say the Office of Intermodal Pl Planning and Programming, but it really came from the ITTF fund, the Innovation Transportation Technology Fund. So I would like to thank uh, Secretary Valentine and her team for funding this program. So we are looking for ways to look at some of the issues that I noted. You will be hearing much more about the Virginia Multimodal Regional Multimodal Program in the coming future. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, guys are busy. Everybody's busy. Um, our next speaker is Kate Matthijs with the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission. Over Good to you, Kate. Evening, everybody, and thank you, Mary, for that introduction. Um, indeed, I am Kate Matthijs. I'm with the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, and I'm here today to talk actually focused on a program that's m about moving commuters. Um, I'm so thankful Jennifer Mitchell did a fantastic overview of a lot of the transit things that we have going on with uh, in partnership with the state. And so they're obviously a huge funding partner. But I'm going to dive in, talk about how a very innovative program that's using some of the toll revenues from our express lanes to help commuters move through those corridors. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background about the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission. Um, indeed, we are responsible for a number of different things, including uh, funding and stewardship of a number of things related to WMATA. Um, we are also the co-owners of the Virginia Railway Express, and it's great that Rich Dalton's going to give an overview of what's happening at VRE these days. And we do manage state and regional funding on behalf of our local transit agencies and do a lot of work to help our local transit agencies coordinate and take advantage of a lot of information sharing um, from everything from fair payment um, to, um, as Jennifer Mitchell mentioned earlier, um, looking at a study for doing bus rapid transit that can cross um, our areas in Northern Virginia. Um, so indeed, we are the, um, the they have a uh, multi-decade agreement with the Commonwealth to administer our commuter choice program. If we just jump to the next slide. So I think we're all familiar with the um, express lane network within Northern Virginia. Obviously, VDOT has been very busy um, providing these transportation options. Um, and if we just jump to the next slide, um, what we've been able to do with the commuter choice program is take advantage um, of a number of the more recent express lane projects if you just want to click, I think this is animated, um, so just click through. Um, and so there we go, perfect. Um, so both I-66 inside the Beltway, uh, when that became a tolled facility in December of 2017, um, and then just last year, uh, when the additional express lanes were added on, th on 395, um, NBTC was um, a part of that to make options available using those toll revenues and creating a competitive program. So let me just jump to the next slide and I'll tell you about it. It's our commuter choice program. Um, so what it does, um, it's not a new transit system. Um, what we're doing is we're helping our local transit providers, our local governments do some very innovative things that are gonna move people through these corridors. Um, it does invest these toll revenues um, through a competitive program um, and it's selected based upon how well those projects can actually move more people um, allow people to access different job and other locations um, and really provide transportation options to those who would otherwise pay the toll. So next slide, please. We do have a robust technical evaluation project process for those projects. 
um, where we are looking to see the applications that come in, the tactical merit. Are they moving people through the corridor? Are they helping divert traffic that may go on side roads? We also do look at cost effectiveness, um, how well this fits for readiness um, you know, with any of our localities when they look to apply. Um, are they going to be ready to go? And that's what that applicant preference is. And then also, how well are they working with their partners, whether they be a partner with WMATA or with VDOT, or also partners across jurisdictions? Next slide. So to date, the Commuter Choice uh, Program in the I-66 corridor, again, the one that's been going for three years, um, has funded 35 projects and connected 30 activity centers across Northern Virginia and into the District of Columbia. We have been able to provide both capital and operating for nine new express bus routes and even additional service for seven other bus routes. We've helped construct a park and ride lot. We've done improvements to bus stops, um, helped set up bike share operations, provided carpool vample incentives, and also traveler information um, across that are again benefiting those folks who need to travel through the I-66 corridor. Next slide. For 395 and 95, again, we just started a year ago. We were able to fund the day that the, toll, the express lanes opened. We had 10 projects ready to go. We had eight new or extra bus services that were being provided. And then two regional transportation demand campaigns, including one that was focused on helping our military members at Fort Belvoir and the Pentagon to be able to have understand the options that they have um, to move through that corridor. Next slide. The program is very much focused on performance. Um, and to date, our project has demonstrated the ability to move more people through these uh, lanes, but less vehicles. And that's really what we're getting at. The idea is, is that if you get more people on a bus or more people carpooling, it frees up those lanes so they're less congested and there's more reliability in the travel. Um, and so what we've actually seen um, together with all of our projects since the program started is over 700,000 hours of uh, average tra annual travel time savings for these travelers in that corridor. That is real time. That's the ability to get back for the baseball game or the rehearsal or what have you. So clearly we are seeing a lot of benefits um, to this program. Um, and again, all of this stuff is pre-COVID, but as uh, Monica Backman was saying, we're also looking to the future because people will be getting back on these corridors. Next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot looking across our region um, we do have eligible applicants for our programs from as far south as Spotsylvania County, all the way out to Loudoun County and Prince William County. And what we've really done is through this competitive process has found projects that are benefiting all of the folks that are traveling on these two major corridors. So whether they've been traveling in on OmniRide or been working um, to get more information on bus service from the Pentagon, we've been trying to cover the region very well, again, for those folks who are traveling through those corridors. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I'm sure has been in the back of your mind is all of a sudden COVID. If anybody has been anywhere near I-6 or even I-395 and 95, traffic volumes, especially in sort of April and May, were down to almost nothing. Um, and so obviously we are a toll funded program. So there's there are impacts. I just put it right out there. Um, and the impacts are actually a little bit different between I-66 and 395. So I-66 being a, um, a corridor that was, is only told when folks are going inbound in the morning for a couple of hours and then outbound in the afternoon has seen, honestly, a more dramatic um, impact in the revenues. Um, but what we're also being able to do is be more conservative in how we're allocating that funding. So all of the jurors, all of the projects that we have funded to date they are keeping us in the loop what's going on and what they've actually been able to do is they reduce their service because they're matching demand but it means the funding that we have already funded um, and promised to them they're going to be able to extend that out further um now for 395 and 95 corridor that is a told facility 24 7. so we actually have been able to see a lot of comfort in that um, and we actually, and I, as somebody who's, who has traveled that, um, there still is congestion on that corridor. Um, and so people are still taking advantage of those express lanes. Um, we do expect to be able to fully fund our program, a $30 million program over two years. And the call for projects is open right now. So stay tuned into the spring when you'll be able to look at the different projects that are being proposed and we'll provide this for public comment. Next slide, please. So in summary, 
The Northern Virginia Transportation Commission's commuter choice program is a unique and innovative way that we can move our commuters through these corridors and provide them those options. Um, over the past three years, we really have made it possible to provide new and expanded bus services, helping with new park and rides, fixing up bus stops and what have you, things that are really benefiting those folks who do need to commute in on those corridors. So obviously things are going to changing. We're watching the space, um, but we do um, know that we want to provide options to our commuters when they need to return through those corridors. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, really appreciate it. Our final presentation comes from Rich Dalton, who is the executive director of the Virginia Railway Express. Rich, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hines, and good evening, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Rich Dalton. I'm the chief executive officer for the Virginia Railway Exp Express, and, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, everyone to share information about our capital improvement program. Uh, next slide. Director Mitchell previously uh, gave an overview of transforming rail in Virginia, and, and the next couple of slides are just uh, intended to to put an exclamation point on how important uh, that program is for VRE. Next slide. As as Director Mitchell uh, indicated, the second rail crossing over the Potomac or the new Long Bridge is, is critical. And I just wanted to, to point out that uh, uh, last week on December 3rd, VRE's parent commissions, both NBTC and PRTC, approved agreements with the newly created Virginia Passenger Rail Authority. One of those agreements will in part assist with the funding of the new Long Bridge. Next slide. So VRE's capital improvement program will complement transforming rail in Virginia. Projects include lengthening existing station platforms, adding new platforms, expanding station parking, adding new rolling stock equipment and technology. And integral to a capital improvement program is recognizing the need to maintain current and future assets in a state of good repair. And at VRE, this is no exception. VRE has a robust asset management program rooted in life cycle maintenance strategy for rolling stock and passenger stations, parking lots, and structures, track, and other facilities. Uh, to note, a new $52 million life cycle overhaul and maintenance facility is scheduled to start construction next week at our Crossroads Maintenance and Storage Facility in Spotsylvania County, which of course will contribute to the the safety and reliability uh, throughout our, our service uh, area. The total CIP or uh, capital improvement program is approximately $817 million with approximately 85% of the program fully funded. Next slide. So across our system, we have projects in various stages of implementation from concept to preliminary engineering, environmental review, final design and construction. Uh, these, could, these projects continue to move forward at this time. For project specific information, I'll just point you to uh, vre.org. We have a, a whole host of information for all of the projects, but the next couple of slides I did wanna highlight, uh, highlight a few of these projects that are transitioning into or completing the final design phase. So next slide. The Crystal City Station, uh, located in Arlington County, uh, this project uh, simply will relocate and expand the current Crystal City Station to improve station access and passenger convenience. Uh, once completed, the station will enable simultaneous boardings and alightings of two full length trains. This project is, uh, is nearly completing the uh, preliminary engineering or development phase and will be headed into final design phase soon. The project is funded by NVTA, which I will note is a key partner of VRE with funds also coming from the Commonwealth and other federal sources. Next slide. So at our Fr Franconia Springfield station, uh, which also serves the uh, uh, the Metro Rail system, 
This project will expand platform lengths to minimize extended dwell times with longer trains and accommodate a future third track. This project is completing the final design phase. And this particular project is funded entirely by NVTA. Next slide. So we have the Broad Run Station Expansion Project out in Prince William County as well. And of course, this project has multiple elements. The current station platform will be shifted and lengthened to the east, creating the necessary alignments for additional tracks in the maintenance and storage facility to the west. Uh, additional tracks will enable longer and more trains to be maintained and stored at this location. So if you're looking at this slide, that light blue area in the middle is is essentially the maintenance and storage facility and then just to the right of that is in that black shaded area would be the new passenger uh, station platform and then an additional third main track will be constructed to the east of the platform uh, to minimize conflicts with amtrak and freight trains on the manassas line and then finally additional parking will be constructed to add a net increase of a approximately 300 vehicle parking spaces to this location. This project has completed the preliminary engineering phase and will soon enter final design. And just to note, this project is funded by many of our funding partners, including uh, NVTA, uh, various sources from the Commonwealth, and, 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 at, and in addition to our federal funding partners as well. Next slide. So in summary, uh, at VRE, we're, we're very excited to be at this point in our future. We have worked for many years with our partners and stakeholders in the Commonwealth, in addition to our host railroads to get here. As our ridership, behavior, and commuting patterns are likely to change over time, these projects will continue to strengthen VRE and the Commonwealth's ability to meet demand, maintain our assets in a state of good repair, and provide a safe and healthy mobility solution for our region and beyond now and for generations to come. Thank you. Rich, thanks so very much um, for that great presentation. And I wanna thank all six of our presenters. Um, it, very useful, helpful information, I'm sure for the public. Um, we have been joined by a couple of um, staff folks who carry great weight here in the Commonwealth. So Rob Carey, who is the VDOT Deputy Commissioner, John Lawson, who's the Deputy Secretary of Transportation, as well as our own Helen Cuervo, who's the District Administrator, sorry, District Engineer here in Northern Virginia, are also here listening tonight. So we've finished the presentation part of the agenda, and it's now time to um, uh, begin the public comment, and I'm going to turn it over to Karen Fanuk and Clark, who's just going to walk everybody through the directions again on how to participate in the public hearing. Karen? Thank you, Mary. For those watching the live stream, you can now dial in to our public comment phone number. The number is 1 415 655 0001. Then you need to enter the meeting number or access code which is 126-518-6536, then hit pound. And lastly, the numeric password or alternative ID, which is 35433735. Once you're in, press star three to raise your hand and be added to the queue to provide comment. We'll announce when it's your turn to provide testimony and then we'll un we ask you to unmute your phone line. You will hear your line has been unmuted, after which you'll be able to provide your comment. Please clearly state your name, and if you're so inclined, your jurisdiction and or affiliation. You will have three minutes to provide your comment before the timer goes off. And we then will move to the next person in the queue to provide testimony. A three minute timer will appear on the screen, which will turn white when your time has expired. Once you complete your testimony, we ask you to hang up. If you don't, we reserve the right to do so for you and free up the queue. 
We encourage you to continue watching the meeting on DRPT's YouTube channel. If you're unable to access the meeting due to a full queue, please try dialing in again and maybe again because the queue will open up. Please remember any comments provided through the YouTube live stream chat box will be noted for the record, but not read aloud this evening. If you wish to provide testimony post event, please visit virginiadot.org slash Nova Transportation Meeting for all the comment submission details. You have until January, 20, January 4th, 2021 to provide your feedback. We ask that the elected officials who provide comment via the WebEx platform tonight, please mute any devices not being utilized to provide comment to avoid an echo effect. And for those dialing in via the phone line, mute your computer to avoid any audio interference. But please make sure your telephone is unmuted on your end. If using the call-in line and you did not pre-register to speak, you will be placed in the public comment queue. Everyone utilizing the public comment call-in line will automatically be placed on mute until called upon. Please remember to hit star three to raise your hand, but do not hit star six until prompted. If you do so prematurely, you may be cut off. Regarding public comment conduct, we really do look forward to hearing your feedback and opinions, but we kindly ask that all participants refrain from any type of disturbance involving foul, foul language or verbal abuse. We do reserve the right to disconnect any call if inappropriate behavior occurs. Please do share your opinions and suggestions, whether in agreement or opposition of the initiatives presented this evening. All comments will be made public. And again, you have three minutes to speak. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Now, let's begin with the elected officials who would like to provide comment. When we call on you, Please unmute your computer's audio or phone line to provide comment and mute once again when you conclude when you conclude. If we don't call on you and you'd like to provide testimony, please use the hand raise feature in the WebEx platform so we know to call on you or feel free to speak up as well. As we call on you again, please state your name and jurisdiction. At this point, I'll turn it over to Jenny McCord and Kathleen Leonard who will assist with testimony coordination. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, the first commenter that we have up tonight is Delegate Danica Rome representing the 13th District. Delegate Rome, you can begin your comment. Thank you very kindly. And thank you so much for everyone who's putting this on tonight. Um, some again, um, just for everyone who's watching at home, my name is Danica Rome. I represent the 13th district of the Virginia House of Delegates, which includes the city of Manassas Park and the western Prince William County portions of Haymarket, Gainesville, and my lifelong home of Manassas, which is where I am right now. Um, and the city of Manassas right now is actually carrying my application uh, for the Route 28 star study that we actually did um, that VDOT completed uh, back in May. Um, to basically look at innovative intersection designs along the 28 corridor um, between Bloom's Quarry Lane and Manassas Park up to the Bull Run Bridge um, at the Prince William Centerville or at the Prince William Centerville line. So I just wanted to take these three minutes basically to um, just kind of give the public um, an update about what's been going on corridor wide and also explain the importance of that just going forward, given that the CTP is going to be meeting soon. And um, to Commissioner Hines, to Secretary Valentine, I know you heard um, back in June um, from the Smart Scale Project Manager about this project in particular, which was um, super helpful. Um, but just so people know, we have had updates throughout the quarter, basically ongoing for a good while. In the city of Manassas, they've recently completed um, an extension of the two left-hand turn lanes on southbound Route 28 to get onto Liberia, as well as on the north side at Manassas Junction of turning the right turn lanes into a throughput lane with a series of right turn options. At Manassas Park, they're basically looking at right now of uh, reconnecting Connor Drive out to northbound Route 28 to actually uh, get, create a third act, um, entrance point into the city, which is actually good for first responders as well as for residents. Loudoun County, we've already seen earlier this summer, 
um, an improvement at the green at the Greenway Dalt's Toll Road, basically for having an um, an extension of the ramp that actually connects to 28. And there's a number of other Loudoun uh, County uh, projects going on right now. We've seen the removal of all of the traffic lights in Centerville at the Route 28 I-66 interchange project, with the last of those lights at Braddock and Southbound 28 being removed um, back on, I believe it was November 9th. And at this point, off hours right now, you can get from Dulles back to Manassas within 20 minutes, which is really incredible. And that's from the terminal at, at, at Dulles, at the top of that. And meanwhile, in Bristow and Noakesville, we've actually seen widenings of uh, 28. And we've even had a couple improvements over in Fauquier along the corridor. So this basically leaves the last kind of um, major you know, um, part here that we have to address. On the one hand, we are really fortunate that we've got the 28 widening project going on in Centerville that the MBTA is already authorized, Fairfax County is authorized. It's going to turn 28 from four to six lanes. So you'll have three north and three south. The last thing that the STAR study is really looking at is operational improvements so that we can make your commutes quicker and safer along the 28 corridor in Yorkshire along this 2.1 mile corridor. And if we're able to get this done, especially in front of CTV, if we have a raised median and restricted uh, cross new turns, we're going to be able to cut uh, traffic accidents by about 50% in a year. And at the same time, we'll be able to speed up your commute by about five to 10 minutes. So thank you so much for having me on today. And I really appreciate the opportunity just to give that update about Route 28. Thank you for the update, De uh, Delegate Rome. That was very helpful. Okay, our second speaker that we have on tonight is Falls Church City Council member David Snyder. Mr. Snyder, you can unmute and begin your comment. Well, good evening. Our um, state and region is blessed with the agency leadership that we've had on display again tonight. So it's been a great honor and privilege to work with virtually everyone here who's made a presentation or who is here in an official capacity. The citizens and taxpayers could not be better served. So I want to first of all thank you for that. My comments are really going to be in three general categories. First, some general observations. Second, a couple comments about WMATA. And third, um, a few of the projects that are important uh, to the city of Falls Church. And in fact, the surrounding areas uh, of Arlington and, and uh, Fairfax counties. First of all, a couple observations. Um, the real challenge today is, and it was mentioned in the NVTA uh, presentation with the different uh, analyses of recovery from the pandemic, um, that the situation is going to be different uh, from what it was before. And so planning for this post-COVID reality, which includes more telework and remote work, um, is gonna be a collective challenge. Um, we're gonna need to reorient our trans transportation and transit systems, focusing on the needs and demands as they have evolved during and after the pandemic. That may mean, for example, the old Destin and uh, destination and origin analyses uh, have changed dramatically. And so I think our collective challenge is to use all the resources that we've heard tonight to address these new realities. Clearly, it will include focus on multimodal uh, efforts, focus on preserving reliable bus service because that best serves uh, vulnerable populations and essential workers. We have the additional challenges of considering environmental impacts and reducing greenhouse gases and bringing our region into the compliance of the very ambitious goals set for the region by the Council of Government's Board of Directors. Encouraging innovations um, and um, electrification of the vehicle fleet is a huge challenge and a part and parcel of meeting the environmental requirements. Prioritizing technological advances. I think we've only begin to understand the uh, advantages um, and the benefits that technology can provide. And NVTA has an analysis going on that I think can lend um, a great deal of support to us in the future. And finally, the continued focus um, on safety. Here again, the Council of Government's Transportation Planning Board has done some groundbreaking work on highway safety issues, and they need to be embedded. That work needs to be embedded in everything we do. 
enough with some general comments with regard to WMATA. It's our view that simply reducing funding, making drastic cuts without strategic planning is not an acceptable approach, i.e. bus cut by 45%, rail with 30 minute headways and closing uh, whole metro stations, 19 of them, including East Falls Church. In fact, in the case of Falls Church, we may be paying a lot of money and getting absolutely no bus or rail service. That's not an acceptable outcome. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the proposed um, Metro budget cuts. They need to be significantly fine tuned and a very careful analysis of what achieves the necessary savings, but also maximizes the essential services that the public relies on. Mr. Snyder, can you wrap it up, please? Yep, I sure can. Finally, the projects that are most important to us are the South Oak Street Bridge uh, for state of good repair, the South Washington Street Transit Center for uh, the smart scale project, and the Route 7 BRT, and finally the additional projects under the Route 66 commuter choice. So thank you all very much again for your service to all the citizens of this region. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Our next comment is from Loudoun County Supervisor Kristen Umstad representing the Leedsburg District. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kristen Umstad. I represent the Leesburg District on the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors. I am speaking on behalf of the town of Leesburg tonight on projects that uh, have Board of Supervisors support. I very much appreciate Kimberly Pryor's reassurances that projects won't be delayed even if revenue sharing funds are reallocated to future years. Um, this would affect, however, three projects in Leesburg with recognized positive regional impacts and could potentially delay delivery of those projects. Our request is that VDOT district staff work closely with Town of Leesburg staff to ensure that Leesburg projects are not delayed by this reallocation to future years. It is not clear right now to Leesburg staff how uh, we can avoid delays in these projects given the reallocation. The first project is Battlefield Parkway in Route 7 or East Market Street the interchange that is currently under construction with a projected completion date of the fall of 2021, uh, as long as there is no funding delay. VDOT is proposing to move the revenue sharing funding out to FY22 and FY23. The second project that we're concerned about is the widening of Evergreen Mill Road. VDOT is proposing to move revenue sharing funds out to FY23, which we believe will cause a delay for utility relocations. The third project is Morgan Park Road. And on that project, VDOT is proposing to move the revenue sharing funds out to FY22 and FY23 which we believe would cause a significant delay in this project that is scheduled for land acquisition after the first of the year and construction in the coming summer. Finally, the town of Leesburg has submitted a smart scale project application for the Route 15 bypass Edwards Ferry Fort Evans interchange that is currently in review. The town is currently working with VDOT staff to move the design forward to the field inspection plan stage, utilizing the available $5.4 million of NVTA funding. The town is requesting continued support of its smart scale and future NVTA applications on this important regional project. And I'd like to close by saying we really value our, our partners at VDOT and NVTA. Um, they have just been a joy to work with, but if we could request that VDOT staff work closely with Town of Leesburg staff to ensure there are no delays on these projects, we would deeply appreciate it. And we hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor Umstad. I suspect someone will be in touch about those projects. 
Uh, next up. Our next comment is from Fairfax County Supervisor Kathy Smith from the Sully District. Are you unmuted? I'm unmuted. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody for their hard work on all these projects, especially um, during this time of COVID. And I know the comment was made about the six year improvement program and, you know, how you're going to move the uh, funding to be able to cover the projects. And I appreciate the commitment to ensure that um, these projects are covered. Uh, you know, we know from all of your presentations that the needs are great in the region. We have a lot of great transportation projects that uh, will benefit the community. I, uh, Delegate Rome mentioned things happening in Fairfax County with Route 28 and, and the improvements there. And so my comments are brief. I just appreciate all the work. And I know we all need to continue to advocate for increased funding so that we can meet our needs with our transportation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor Smith. Ms. Hines, I'm doing a quick scan of the WebEx and we do not have any additional elected officials uh, logged in to speak. Well, great, then I guess it's time to uh, take any speakers we have on the call-in line. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started with the callers that we have on the line. Uh, we are asking that you remember to hit star three to raise your hand so we know to call on you. I will call out the last two digits of your phone number to let you know that it is time to provide your testimony. If there are multiple participants with the same last two digits, you will hear a prompt to let you know to unmute your phone line and that it is now your turn to speak. So with that, we will begin with the caller ending in four, six, you will hear a prompt to hit star six to unmute your line. Please do, do so to join the event and provide your testimony. Remember to mute to re remember to unmute your line and make sure all other devices are muted. Hello. Kathleen, maybe you should say those two digits again. Sure, we're going with the caller ending in the last two digits of four, six. Please remember to un unmute your line at this time. Maybe we should go to the next person and um, we can come back at the end. Maybe they'll have figured it out. I think that's actually the only caller we have logged in at this time. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, we did discuss this, uh, what to do. And our decision was that we would stay here until eight o'clock, which is the advertised end of this meeting. Um, and, uh, and so we will. Um, we do want to thank everybody who came to watch and listen. Um, encourage you if you have any other, uh, if you want to leave comments in any other way, to go to virginiadot.org, um, joint transportation meeting, and it will give you a number, NOVA transportation meeting, sorry, it will give you a number of ways to leave a comment. But we'll be here for anyone who wants to call in uh, up till eight o'clock. So again, with that, we will go to caller ending in four, six. You will hear a prompt. So hit star six to unmute your line. Please do so to join the event and provide your testimony now. Make sure that your phone line is unmuted and that all other devices are on mute. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? 
Uh, my apologies. I was hitting star six instead of no. I was hitting pound six instead of star six. So <laughs> operator error. I'm Rob Whitfield with the Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance. Thank you for having this meeting tonight, and uh, I hope there were about 94 people online uh, when I got off to take uh, to, to speak to you all. My concern is that most of the public does not know most of the details of the programs that you are undertaking. And I don't know how best to suggest it, but there needs to be in the print media or even TV something to help popularize, more more popularize what you're doing. And, and I realize it's challenging in the COVID-19 environment. My main concern is that as to the composition of the CTP, two years ago, I mentioned to Secretary Valentine that over 2 million people live in outside the Beltway areas of Northern Virginia, and inside the Beltway is about 500,000. We need better representation for, for the areas outside the Beltway. That's obviously a legislative action. The other thing is that Nick Donahue has told me that Transit projects are not subject to the financial plan requirements for projects of value of 100 million or more, which are required of highway projects. That inequity needs to be resolved. As to the projects themselves, my very biggest concern is about the transforming rail projects in Virginia, for which no financial plan of any kind. Obviously, the Long Bridge is a huge priority. Everybody understands that. But we certainly need a fair financing plan that is not just loaded onto I-66 commuters. We need, we need to understand the funding coming from D.C., from Amtrak, and from Arlington and Alexandria. Uh, and so I, I've asked for these things several times over the last year and have not had any kind of response on the financial plan. So please provide that to us before the General Assembly starts. And I have many other thoughts and questions, but I, I do appreciate the efforts that you've made tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield, for your comments. Again, if you'd like to make public comment this evening, please dial 1-415-655-0001. Enter the meeting number or access code 126-518-6536 and then hit pound. And lastly, enter the numeric password or alternative ID 3543-3735. You will then enter the queue on mute. Please press star three to raise your hand and be added to the queue to ask a question. We will then announce when it is your turn to provide testimony tonight, and then you can unmute your phone line. You will then hear a prompt that lets you know to hit star six to unmute your line. Please follow the instructions to be looped into the meeting. You will then be able to provide your comments. We ask that you do not hit star six until you hear the prompt or unmute. Otherwise, you will be cut off. And it doesn't look like we have any other uh, folks in the queue at this time.
guessing that some of our YouTube watchers may be drifting off. And so before they all leave, I did want to take a minute to thank um, everybody who part provided feedback and who attended today. Um, and I really want to thank the staff. Um, we could not have done this without an incredible array of staff from um, every agency that participated. Um, and we hope that people have found the, the program to be um, informative and beneficial. And of course, um, you can watch tomorrow. And again, if you um, wake up in the middle of the night and you have a pressing comment, don't forget you can leave it for us at virginiadot.org backslash Nova Transportation Meeting, either um, in a voicemail or on an email or even by regular US mail. Um, so we appreciate very much everybody's attention and attendance this evening. Um, and uh, we'll be here till eight in case other, uh, others call in late.
Thanks again to those of you who joined us for the Joint Northern Virginia Transportation Meeting. We appreciate your attendance. I want to call out and thank the incredible staff who made this all possible, um, and without whom none of this would have worked. It's been a real team effort and it's been a great presentation. So thanks to everybody and we'll be signing off here in a minute or so. Once again, this recording will be saved to our dear YouTube channel and posted on the B dot website. All right. And um, court reporter, you're going to submit the information uh, 10 days from the 4th. Is that okay? Thank you. And I will provide a final transcript to everybody. All right, thanks everyone. Are you um